Ready? Hello and welcome to Rhythm and Pixels, a video game music podcast. This is episode 30-9 and we are your hosts. My name is Rob Nichols. And I'm Pernil. And every week we get together and we hang out and we listen to great video game music from all consoles and all generations. Uh, last week was our 300th episode spectacular and I went back and listened to it and it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that episode. If you're a new listener, it's a great, I think it's a great way to get to know us. Through our, through our, uh, our, our best bits. <laughs> no, so check. Making, it was all the bits that were fit to rake, as, as they say. As they say. And um, so check that out. And this week, it's, we're a little bit different because we're just playing it safe because it's that time of the year. Every time of the it's, year, for some reason, right, this, <laughs> right now. Um, so yeah, Purnell coming in live. From uh, Internet World in his <laughs> Internet Topia in his retro room. In the re- it's called the retro room. Yeah, it is the retro room or the library, pretty much. So That's I need it. to rearrange this. I thing like, a it's bit. the retro room because it's very red in that room. Oh yeah. Did you and paint, did you paint that, or, or was that red when you came in? Oh, I painted this room, and it's funny because when I moved into this house, uh, it was a neutral color originally, mm. and I was like, no, this is my first house. I'm going to go wild with the color and choose what I want. So I had like various shades of like blues, like royal blue and sky blue and all that. And in this room, I was like, I want, I want this weird like firecracker color. And my dad was like, that's a terrible color for a room. I was like, well, it doesn't matter. It's my house. I can paint wherever I want. It's I'm like, going to paint this terrible color. And it's not a terrible it color. Was, it's but it is like, it is red. It is a deep red. It's it's not firecracker red. That's like. That's like blood red, man. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like the room is that the, the paint was actually called like firecracker, though. Oh. Like I think it's just the way it came you know, out when it's it dry. It's probably just dark in there. Is what it is. So if it was bright, that's possible because uh, we did a but, room, uh, Christie's office. We did a room that's like it's it's green when it's dark, but it's really bright yellow when it's when it's bright outside. And by the right time of day, this is like the Twin Peaks room. Like, hi, Pernell, don't <laughs> play the games. Oh, no, it's Rhythm and Pixels, directed by David Lynch. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, I would love it. All we need is some pie. Bust out the pie and coffee. I'm oh. drinking coffee, so we're halfway there. I finished the pie yesterday. <laughs> I had That's to. There it is. I ate the whole thing. That was, <laughs> uh, That's a fun reference of it. So, I ate the whole thing. <laughs> Old old man movies there for you folks, uh, but at the same time, it's good that we're old men because that's how we can remember all these retro games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some of, well, I mean, one of us can remember all the retro games. <laughs> I sort of Touché. do. I sort of do. Um, I want to wish um, to everyone who celebrates it uh, a happy and merry Christmas. Um, as just just passed, as this episode comes out, it'll be close to the new year, and our and new for year's everyone epi- else. Mm-hmm. I was there for everyone else. We got Crazy Kwanzaa, a Tip Top Tet, <laughs> and a Ram- and, a, and a, Ram- a rambunctious Ramadan. Actually, no, it should be a solemn Ramadan. Yeah, there was a, sol- but- a very solemn Ramadan. Uh, yeah, I know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> if Thank you're keeping you. track of our Simpsons quotes, you can start drinking now. <laughs> <laughs> crazy Kwanzaa. Uh, but no, yeah, uh, as such, Pernell uh, gets together with uh, us and a whole family and we eat until we're stuffed and we didn't play any games this time around we usually do but we like to play board games all the time Pernell and my family and well this week is all about board games the show's all that's about right board. The, this episode is all about board games the show is really about Pernell playing board games <laughs> <laughs> so like a little bit of added context to it is like as rob said we're a board we're we're a board game establishment uh, but in addition to that, a few weeks ago, I attended PAX Unplugged. Um, thankfully, before the crazy surges took place, as it were. Um, but as a result, while there, I was able to play a bunch of different games and check out some new products. And also try to ticker tape everybody to see about getting review copies of games, because that's the kind of guy I am this month. Um, so as a result, the idea came to mind. Like, how about we talk about some board games on the show? And using our usual um, style of show or recording to get them out there. So, if I remember correctly, I just randomly sent Rob like four topics, which technically could eventually become full episode topics on the show. Rob's like, "Uh oh, I don't think that happened." 
good at remembering things. I'm I am a professional rememberer. <laughs> uh, I sent to four topics uh, to choose tracks from, um, and then based on those topics, they all tie to like a different game I played. So, and I did the same thing, of course, over here. But Rob's like, I did not do that. Wow, I don't Which remember case, this at all. I remember you saying like, we're going to do these topics in, in a few weeks, and I said, cool. <laughs> in that case. On the fly changeup. So I'm still doing that, but Rob will choose the tracks that he picked. And you said you would you base them off of then? I base them on board games. <laughs> okay, so Rob's tracks will be based on board games, and I'll still describe specific games. We'll talk about the games yeah. in general. So let's and let, let's do that then. So because I'm really curious about these topics that I should have written down. And maybe I did, <laughs> but thought they were something else. So um, as we do on the show. Um, we find music related to the topic that we're talking about. So um, whether it's RPGs or whether it's fantasy games or whether it's jazz music. But this week, it's I guess it's four different topics. Or well, it would have been technically a total of eight. Wow. Okay. This is, right. this is a topic full extravaganza. <laughs> this is a topic extravaganza. So I'm, I'm, I'm extremely curious now. Do you mind getting started? Sure, I can go with that. Let's do it. So... The first topic, this is an easy one, honestly. The first topic is we're going to be quoted as ascending, ascent, scaling, climbing. So any of that kind of stuff. All synonyms for the same thing. Ascent. Um, and the track is from the game Catherine. And the track title, which is, I didn't realize this for the most part. Well, I kind of did. But anyway, Dovarak Symphony Number no. 9 in E minor. And this is done by, originally composed by Antonin Dovarak, but it was remixed by Shoji Maguro. Oh, it's a, so it's a Shoji Maguro arrangement of a classical tune. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. Surprisingly, the entire OST outside of, like, the bar is that. Welcome back. You're listening to Dvorak Symphony Number no. Nine in E Minor, Up Ninety Five. This was originally composed by Antonin Dvorak, but for the game Catherine, it was remixed by Shoji Maguro. So, this track came to mind immediately for this game that I'm going to talk about in a second because Catherine is a game where the main character Vincent is haunted in his dreams and a series of nightmares where he is constantly scaling upwards to escape an ever-collapsing tower, generally sometimes being chased by nightmares on the way up. It's an interesting puzzle action game. And this particular level is probably one of my least favorite in the game. <laughs> it brings back traumatic nightmares because it's an ice level, so you already know it's painful. Um, but also the theme of the level was pretty rough too. Mm. So 
The idea and why I chose this track and the theme of Scent was because one of the games that I played, which may well end up being a board game beats episode in the, next, in the coming weeks or so, is a game called Summit. It was published by Inside Up Games hmm. and created by a guy named Connor McGoy. So, obviously this is a game that you might end up liking too, or I'm hoping you do when we get a chance to play it. It's essentially a game where it's a long map, which, spoiler, talking to the guy who developed it, he said he really designed it by taking a President's Choice pizza box and folding it outward <laughs> and then <laughs> building the game inside the pizza box. Okay, I like which that. Is, that's, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> and he was like, trivia, he's like, if you actually unfold the pizza box on your own spare time, you actually get the exact dimensions of the game board. Hmm. Um, but on this board, there is a, there's a base camp area and a summit to a mountain. And in between, there are a lot of space where you can put in tiles. And these tiles are meant to represent rope that you use. You know, when you're scaling a mountain, you have to, you know, pick in the rope. And the rope can be very based on different types, like, you know, easy scaling or scaling in a way where it'll deprive more oxygen of the player by going through that area and stuff like that. So as you're scaling this mountain and placing these tiles, you're dealing with issues of having enough food with enough oxygen and also just becoming exhausted. And if you run out of these things and your health goes down, your character dies. Um, and the goal of the game is to get through, you know, get to the bot top of the mountain and then back down mm -hmm. while engaging, you know, the weather conditions that take place and various unfortunate and common events that take place. Um, a cool thing about this game, too, is also that his design intent, and apparently this is a thing he's carrying across a lot of his games, is uh, he wants there to be like a sort of like co-op version and a competitive version. Mm. So the co-op version, of course, is everybody working together to scale the mountain. While the competitive version is you can, you know, knock, you can hurt each other, like damage each other, by like destroying ropes and stuff like that. But there's a karma gauge on the side where depending on how bad <laughs> you are, worse things can happen to you over time. So you have to balance it out. It's a weird concept. And I did play the co-op version, but I'm looking forward to doing more with the competitive. So it's a it's a cool concept for a game, I think. And it's not easy at all. It's really not. Um, but I don't know. Like, it's interesting that I feel like it's like there's so many games out there that when it came time to come up with all these topics, like the past rounds, like, you know, this should be kind of fun because I like the idea of trying to link these yeah. games, to these topics. And if you think if you're like, that's ah, since Pernell, that was a terrible choice of game for this topic. You let me know. No, Call me on it. This game sounds awesome. It reminds me of another one called K2. Oh, I never heard of that. Tell me more about uh, that one. K now, K2 is just going up the mountain, and it's kind of it's more of like a race between your friends, but you're managing the a risk versus reward, or like a, the reward being more movement and the risk being like oxygen and food. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can just die on the mountain, and your friends just overtake you. You know, so. Oh. I don't know much more about the game mechanics, but that's kind of the idea. But this one sounds a lot more interesting in that you're kind of sharing and not sharing resources. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's really clever. I, I really enjoy games that implement that well because sometimes I think a game can implement that sort of um, interaction between the players. But when you start playing the game, like no one's doing it because everyone's worried about their own stuff, you know? And so this, mm -hmm. this amazing mechanic just never gets used. Um, because like, why would you use it if you're just worried about yourself all the time? But if it's really integral to this game, then that that's really exciting. Yeah, and the way he described it to me, and the way it was on the actual um, cooperative version that I played, it definitely resonates. Because there were times where like I needed to get a tool out, but my Sherpa was carrying it, so I had to kill a turn off by dropping a piece of equipment on the ground that someone can grab on the way behind me. Uh, they could pick it up, and then my Sherpa gave it to me on the next turn, and I was able to use it to like, create an extra rope oh, across the cool. hazardous zone. Oh, man, I want to cool I, I try that one. Yeah, that one sounds really neat. Sounds really neat. And really all neat. the pieces are triangular. I'm a sucker for triangle pieces. Yeah. I, I, growing up, my my grandpa had a game called Triominoes that was that was just dominoes in a triangle, tri tri triangular you know, it was, it was a triangle domino game. <laughs> <laughs> Triangular. You had three numbers instead of two. Hey, it was awesome. I really enjoyed that game. So, yeah, I, I like the triangle-based boards and things like that. Because, I mean, hexagons. Hexagons have been used forever, right? I mean, hexagons are mm -hmm. great, great for games. You know? oh, but don't get me wrong. I still love hexagons. You give me a hex, it might be a sale. But <laughs> Why use but, four sides when you can have six? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Only the most sides will do. All right, so what's my topic then? Because I don't know. All right, so your first topic <laughs> will be calming. Oh, calming. Okay, perfect. I can do that. I can do calming. 
This is a, <laughs> <laughs> this is a very relaxing game that I used to play a lot with my wife and then and then became very frustrating later. But this has an amazing, relaxing soundtrack that I've played before in the past on a board game episode. This is The track is called Wind from the game Scrabble Complete Ooh. for the PC. The composer is unknown, unfortunately. Uh, within the game and within the, the, the credits, there's just no, there's no composer info. So this is Wind from Scrabble Complete for the PC. was the track Wind from the game Scrabble Complete for the PC. The composer is unknown, but oh, that is a sexy, sexy Scrabble song. <laughs> it really is. Like, this is the kind of jam where it would make me want to just play Scrabble for the OST, despite knowing that I'm probably going to get my butt beat. I'm going to play the uh, play the word sexy, four letters. That's actually the, uh, 14 points. Oh my god! It's sexy. For, would it be worth fourteen points? That's the question. I have like, a, did you actually look up the letters score points? I have an app for that. Yeah. Oh my god! Also, Scrabble's like it's one of those games where like this uh, is a jam. As we, jam is four points. Mm, like no. as we play more <laughs> four points. As we play more board games, and they get more complicated, and also sometimes simpler too, depending on what you're purchasing. A lot of people come to like to come up and say, "Well, we don't need to play these old games like Scrabble or Monopoly or whatever anymore." And I'm of the camp where it's like, no, there's definitely still a place for any of these games, even Monopoly. Like, there's, I would play any of those games if someone hey, you want to get down with some Scrabble. Though, admittedly, I'd rather play Spell Smashes at this point, or Letter Tycoon, but I would also just play Scrabble. It's still a solid game. But, the game in question, and the reason why I gave you a calming, is a game called Chai, as in Chai T. It's published by Steeped Games and is designed by Dan Casimir and Connie Casimir. So, I almost bought chai, and I still may. I haven't decided yet, but it's a cool idea where the goal is you're brewing chai tea, various Ooh. blends of chai oh, tea. Oh, I love it. I love it, because there's so much goes into chai. So many spices. Mm-hmm. And there's like three aspects of the game. It's a fairly simple game, honestly, but... Describing it may not be so simple because there's like a there's like a market where you can buy you know, like the ingredients and they're represented by little tiles mm-hmm. and they slide from right to left. Farther right they are down, the more expensive they cost to buy. But as you take a tile out, everything gets pushed to the left so it becomes cheaper. Now here's the rub though: 
if you take a tile and it's adjacent to other tiles that are of the same ingredient, you get them all while only paying the cost of one. Mm. So it's like you can kind of like link stuff and chain yeah. it and get like super like almost like Puyo Puyo spice combos. It's kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. Where it's um, like I want to do like ginger, ginger, cardamom, like have four cardamoms in a row and then something else so I can grab all the cardamom. Yep, Put exactly like this. And it's a lot of fun to do this. So you take those along with the leaves you start with, because each player starts with a specific type of leaf that they can buy from other players if they need the other types of leaves. And there's like another market that you can use. And you take those combinations and you fulfill customer requests. That's how you get your points. And uh, it's not a complicated game, which is why I was hesitant to buy it off the top. I was like, well, this game have longevity to me. But it was relaxing to play. Like, I like the idea of being like, oh, I got nice, I got these rooibo leaves over here. I got my... <laughs> I got my ginger leaves and I got my my steeper. Oh, you know, that, that guy looks great. really cozy. Yeah, it's 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 nice. Like it was really nice. Like I guess I don't be surprised if somewhere down the line I still end up getting it, <laughs> maybe <laughs> like a sale or something. There's but. Like, like there's there's nothing more relaxing than a cup of chai, honestly, and like not oh, even yeah. like caffeinated. Like we used to have a rooibos chai tea. So rooibos is a is is a it's not a black tea leaf. You know, it's not caffeinated. So, and the rooibos is just the rooibos flower, but with all the chai spices with it, oh, mm-hmm. it, was, it was the best. I can't find it anymore, but it, like every time I see it, I would buy as many boxes as I could, and you know, I like, dump a ton of milk into it and a whole lot of honey. <laughs> and then, yeah, oh, he's I like, get, I gotta make this sweet as possible. I love it. I love it. And then I get um, ginger snaps, you know, those big, like, really, really, those really hard ones because mm-hmm. you dip them in the tea and they get just soft enough. Ooh. The soft ginger snaps in a chai tea and I am I can sit back and enjoy the ending of Persona 5 just someday <laughs> someday now it's not just, this day but someday or a book or a magazine or your Nintendo Switch <laughs> whatever option. suits your fancy but I mean you could tell I I, I uh, summoned my inner, inner hammock on this track <laughs> God, that's a, yeah, honestly, a hammock, guitar is, hammock is the king of calm. Mm. Yeah, for but outside of the buddy cuffs, I want to get him back on for a non hammock type episode. Hammock is known as the king of calm, but I want to see how he rolls when he has to step out of that box. I don't know if I mean I'm sure I'm sure he's got boxes outside of his chill outside of the chill zone, but I don't know if I want him out there. I love him and I love the chill zone. Oh, we all do. But there's just something to be said about seeing how the man works outside of his element. We can call him Waterbed for that episode, or I don't know, like, not hammock. He can be, what do they call those terrible beds? You know, you know, couch couch pullout or pullout bed. <laughs> it could be, oh, uh, a futon. <laughs> futon, yeah, we'll call him futon. <laughs> we'll call him there futon. we go. <laughs> like an uncomfortable, like, not calming bed. Like, yeah. futon! UVGM, uncomfortable VGM. <laughs> <laughs> I swear that would be such a fun episode just to see him try. Like, because I know he's got it in him, but I'm curious as to what wow. he would choose if, if he, he had play to step un- out of the if box. If he could play uncomfortable, that's only 22 points. <laughs> Still a scrabble. But well, I guess probably, we are on the scrabble track. If you're playing, if you're playing, if you're playing uncomfortable, I mean, you're probably going to get a bingo because you're going to have to use all seven letters. So that's that's going to be 72. <laughs> And you might you might hit a double word along the way, so but on its yeah. own, that's that's it's weak, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to bring definitely bring Letter Tycoon over at some point. I think you guys will enjoy that. Oh, I love word games. The Spell Smashers was a good time. Oh yeah, it's one of the best. And yeah. if anybody's listening to this and you're like, "What the heck is Spell Smashers?" Like, you would love it. Yeah, especially it, like RPGs because it does the whole RPG equipment bit. Yeah, it's a word game plus RPGs. It's pretty dope. Okay, so we are on to your next track. And our next game. Okay. Actually, this will be good because I actually, despite owning the game for like a decade, I only discovered the track t- in the last like day or two because I've never played my copy of the game. But I am going to play it tonight. <laughs> um, the game is on a Nintendo DS and it is called A Witch's Tale. And the topic of choice for this is referred to as witchcraft. Um, the track title is called Get Serious and is composed by Sarah Sakura.
Welcome back. You're listening to Get Serious from the game A Witch's Tale on the Nintendo DS, composed by Sarah Sakurai. And the topic of choice for this was witchcraft. Funny enough, the game itself, I bought it because one, um, Nipponichi Software developed it and it was published by Nis America. And two, it reminded me of Rhapsody in the sense that the main character is a witch and she fights using toys that she finds and gets to join her cause. In Rhapsody, she used puppets, like possessed puppets. She was also a magic witch character type. Um, I don't know a ton about the game overall because, again, I am playing my own copy until after this episode. But uh, the idea, to my understanding, is that she unleashes like some like a, a group of a menagerie of like evil witches by, you know, opening a door she shouldn't have or whatever. Now she's on a quest to re-steal them and rescue the na- the nation's princesses or whatever. Um, I'm looking forward to playing it now because this track. When I was going through the OST, it hit me really hard because for Rob, as well as anybody who's been following the show for a while, you know I have an affinity for, like, dark circus stuff. Like, circus music. <laughs> I um, always just joked about that. Like, I didn't. I thought you, I thought you took offense to that. No, it's a joke that oh. actually has a lot of bearing. Like, I, I ham it up when I'm like, oh, come on, stop. Hey, oh, circus music. But it's true. There's, like, this... There is, like, a sort of, like, mischievous, you know, rambunctious feel that comes from, like, circusy tunes. There was some dark circus in there, and look the heck out. I'm ready for the carnival to come to town. And this track is pretty much that on point. Um, but the game that I was thinking about when I chose Witchcraft as the topic is a game actually titled Witch Stone. It is an interesting game. It was pretty much published by Hutch. The company that you, that made, you know, my favorite, Keyflower. Um, and it was published by Martino Cicciera in Rainier Kinesia. Rainier Kinesia is a really famous board game yeah, designer. Yeah. Um, and this game, I'm not even going to design describe it probably because it's one of those like point salad games where you know it's like a bunch of random mechanics. But the idea is that you're a bunch of witches preparing for like the Grand Gala Ball. So in order to prepare in your best way possible, you do a bunch of stuff that makes no sense outside the context of the game <laughs> you are taking these like bits that are like the equivalent of like dominoes and they have like a symbol on each end and you're connecting them inside of a cauldron and depending on how you chain those you can link a bunch of actions together and each of those types of actions correspond to another place on the board whether you're building out a road map to get you know wizards to a castle mm-hmm. or you're trying to like work in the library mm. to like get a bunch of bonus pips that you can use to apply for one-time bonuses. There's a magic wand bonus you can use to, like, get one-time bonuses you scale along it. And there's one other bonus I genuinely don't even remember anymore. Um, it's the sort of game where, like, if I had a review copy of it, that would be me, like, being like, I gotta type up a review for this one. Like, hey, four players, this is a lot of meat. Um, but it's a game that I honestly came really close to buying. Like, I, the only reason I didn't was because when I was playing, I felt, you know, I feel like I have another game or two that kind of has this similar pointsality feel that I haven't gotten a chance to play, or enough of, like Coinbra. Coinbra, as you know, oh. is a game that has a ton of different, like, things happening at once that all generate different points in different ways. Yeah. Same idea yeah, cap- Capitalizing on those stra- the right strategy at the right time, especially in the, in the case of Coinbra, where the number of turns are so limited that those decisions are really, really heavy. So does it does mm-hmm. it feel kind of like that where like your decisions are really really heavy because yes. time is limited? Yes. And for those who are listening and like what the heck do you mean by that? There's like a there's a style of game not particularly point salad, though a lot of these games are point salad, where the idea is that the score usually ends up being very high. There's a ridiculous number of ways to get points, but you have a very limited amount of time to do any of those things, which means you can't do all of it can only do a specific number of things so you find yourself wondering should i should i spread myself thin mm-hmm. should i maximize this one thing or should i work on these three things just enough yeah. and that takes a lot of plays to really master and get good at that kind yeah of but i find like games like that are almost really good for like almost like a beginner's luck type thing because if, it, if it's my first time playing a new game Often what I'll do is, like, I want to win or I want to get competitive, but I know that it might not happen my first playthrough as I'm still learning. So I'll mm-hmm. try to do is I'll try to do every every mechanic that I can in the game just to see what it does and just to see how it all feels together. And in, in a game like that or a game that has so many, like, mechanics that you're limited on, you might end up just, like, landing on the right strategy anyway because you're trying more things where if I got in my own head, 
I might be avoiding some of those options, you know, mm-hmm. and which happens and all the time. And there's something to be said about this, too, because for anybody who's listening to this and they're like, um, could obviously anyone, I would assume that everyone listening to our show is at least in some way a fan of video games. Uh, one thing about board games like this that I appreciate as a fan of video games is the fact that I'm having, in my, apparently I'm having trouble thinking of video games that carry a similar heft in the competitive sphere. Like, I feel like the closest might be something like Killer Queen, where you have three different conditions to win the game, but it's not a balancing act like something like this is. And that game is just like opportunity for berries. Look, put the berries in the in the mm-hmm. hive to win. Or you might have the one player who's moving the snail because you can get the snail across yeah. the map. You I win w- that w- way. I almost want to say like real time, like some of the RTS games, like StarCraft and stuff, maybe. There is still the one the one win condition, which is to annihilate the other player, but there's so many different paths you can take along the way, and you probably mm-hmm. have to keep track of all these different things at the same time in order to, to do the optimal thing. Um, so, that is true. And, 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 but but neither of us are really fans of that genre, so we don't we're not we don't really know that super well. And if I were to be if I were to be put in this situation to play one of those games, I would just be terrible at it. <laughs> Yeah, cause I, I mean, honestly, like I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'll flat out agree. I'm terrible at those games. Oh, I know. Um, I, but- I, I can't keep this, the strategies in my head, even when, when things get really um, uh, technical or, or um, strategic in like shooters, like first-person shooters. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, I'll just hide behind a rock. I'm good at that. <laughs> <laughs> if I can manage to deal with the controls, I can work with the strategy of a, of a of PS type deal. Because like I can get spont- I can be spontaneous. I can. Makes decisions on the fly. Oh, this is your but new bubble. The- this is your new. This is your new online profile. I can be spontaneous. <laughs> I can make decisions on the fly. Bam! Date me, baby. <laughs> I know games. Wait, don't say that. Don't don't put that on my profile. That would give me no <laughs> hits. Um, but uh, I I do feel like I can do those sorts of things. But when the issue boils down to okay, I'm not good at controlling a gun with a mouse <laughs> and keyboard. And, or my reaction time is just slightly slower than this guy who plays these games better than me. That's when I fall off the pike. But if I can plan and make choices mm-hmm. and actually like decide things, I can roll with the punches. Yeah, and my I accuracy think- on this thing is awful. Because once the stress comes into play, my, I'm like, I'm like the guy Hail. running around on the field, like pointing the gun up in the air, going, "Am I doing it right?" <laughs> Hail Marys! <laughs> just like launching grenades, like they'll land somewhere. <laughs> I don't care where. I did that Stand a lot. With, uh, team Fortress Two. I used to really love playing that game, but like I was never gonna carry the team. I was always gonna be like just really supportive, you know, like we could do it, guys. And then I'll just end up like. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. I used to do direction. though. What's up? I can tell you one thing I used to do though for fun in some of those games because if I was bad at it. But I also wanted to be a jerk. Sometimes mm-hmm. I would do this thing where, like, I would just like launch a grenade, or like if I had a grenade launcher type weapon, I would just like fire it at an arc in the air. No, I'm about to die. So when the guy comes to take me out, they're in an area where like it's like this parting shot just comes down from the sky. I was like, boom! Like I died, but you're coming with <laughs> me. I knew where this was gonna happen. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, I kind of miss those days. The Team Fortress Two days on uh, on 360 on the on the on the Xbox 360. You and me both. That and about and Left for Dead. Like, Back for Blood came out, and I was like, man, like that rock band, Left 4 Dead, those games were like, and Bomberman, also Bomberman Bomberman Online, those were like the ones where I was like, this is like the time to get together and just like game it out, and as we get older and the community spread out and stuff, it's just hard, or just our lives change, it's hard to get that kind of momentum going again, but the memories, thankfully, are still there, Oh yeah, and I can still roll with the best of them. All right, so what, what do you have for me now? All right, here's where it gets a little more challenging for you, sir. Yeah, it's going to get very challenging. In fact, this one's very specific, so I I'd know. be shocked if you have one for this. Forest slash nature. Okay. All right, so um, there's a lot of... Okay, yeah, here we go. We could do this. <laughs> uh, tabletop RPGs, you know? They, they mm-hmm. always, most of them take place in fantasy settings. There are um, uh, living forests that you know, witches will pull their magic from and cast their spells and, and, and gnomes and elves will live in the forests as well, right? <laughs> in the and, forest! And, and one of the first introductions to tabletop RPGs that a lot of people have had that are my age, our, our age, is Hero Quest. The tabletop Ooh. game Hero Quest, which had a video game adaptation. I did not know this. It came out on the Amiga and it came out on DOS. The music was composed by Barry Leitch. 
or um, Barry Lich, Barry White, <laughs> Barry White. <laughs> oh baby, going on a hero quest. That's a very mm. early, early PC game, so we don't have a whole lot of music. We're gonna hear the main theme from Hero Quest. This is this is the track um, played on the DOS system. This one's composed by Barry Leitch. You're listening to Hero Quest. This is the version for the PC composed by Barry Leach. This came out in 1991. There's a lot, a lot to this song. Um, like you said, this is music that probably plays throughout the game, like the entire game, um, as you play. Maybe not just the title screen. 
but it's um, looking at some gameplay of this, it is impressive. So Hero Quest is really like a, a tabletop RPG in the sense where you have players and a dungeon master, so it has to be at least two players. Um, the entire board is squares, and you're rolling dice, I think, for movement, or the, your movement is on the card. You can only move that many spaces at a time. And uh, the, the dungeon master is actually placing physical doors and chairs and tables and monsters on the, on the board and fighting against you. And it's very like simple, just running around fighting things. There's no story to be told. Um, unless you tell the story with the game, which is what me and my friends did growing up. Funny enough, I actually never played it. Well, I hadn't played it up until we went to Retro World to see yeah. the Pixel Tunes. Well, XVGM slash uh, what the oh my god, um, can't VG Embassy guys. We mm -hmm. went up there to meet them for the first time, and they had Hero Quest at Retro World Expo. And that's when you was like, hey, "This is this game. You should check it out." That's your first time playing that. That was my first time oh, playing wow. Hero Quest. That was really, I mean, so <laughs> while my friend Steve, when we were like real little, like real little, I guess like sixth grade, seventh grade, um, his um, his parents gave him Hero Quest for Christmas, and then an uncle or another family member gave him Hero Quest for another for another uh, instance, like a birthday or something. And so he had two copies, and it was perfect because that means we had two boards that we could stick together. And we had all these extra components that we can move around and we can make these enormous campaigns. And like, and that was our summers. Like we would just play this thing over and over again. And of course you were given these cards with different characters on them, but that didn't mean you had to use those characters. We would draw our own faces and make our own cards. And then like when the game was over, we would keep those characters and like we would level them up and add new stats and new abilities. Like you should really look in the gloom haven. The way you're describing your love of this game, despite despite the fact you'd have, you'd probably want to find it on a decent deal because it's not a cheap game. Mm. I think you'd like Gloomhaven. I did see that they had Gloomhaven at Target, at least one of the versions of Gloomhaven. Yeah, that would be the one you'd probably want to get because it's like the cheaper one in the sense that like it's meant to be an expansion, but it's a standalone expansion to the main game, mm. so you can play it alone, and it's again much cheaper than the main game, so you can get on board with it through that. But yeah, I don't know. I think it's, you'd like it. It's been a long time since I played a game like this. So, yeah, that's that's something that um, I just have really fond memories of doing. And I, I like that the rules are pretty hard set. You know, it's not like a dungeon master explaining everything and, and having to know which dice to roll. It was just it was just six sided dice, and that was the whole game. And so, um, and then you just use your used your your imagination for the most part. But you know, as a kid. It was great having those additional like three dimensional components that put on the board, like the doors and the monsters and things. Um, mm. That was that was really really neat. Um, so we are buying our nephew a Dungeons and Dragons like starter kit to see if he'll oh, be cool. interested in that kind of thing. And so I think Christy, are you getting him one that's like based Dungeons and Dragons, or are you getting one of the theme ones that have been coming out lately? There's like a Stranger Things Dungeons and Dragons. Oh no, this is this There's is this like is D &D. anime ones. This is like D and D like introductory sure. like it has like a, a manual it has like papers and it has um like like a starter like campaign type thing so so yeah i'm, I'm looking forward to seeing if he gets if he's interested in doing it and then yeah, you, we asked you if you wanted to get involved and we'll do like a little game together with him um, that'd be fun yeah. it'd be interesting to watch him try to come up with these like stories like you go to the store and there's <laughs> a guy and I'm like what does the guy say he says would you like to make a purchase? And I'm actually, like, I want to go fishing. Actually, Christy's really interested in doing the uh, uh, the game master uh, situation. So, oh, she's going to game master. Yeah, yeah. At least if unless he gets interested in trying it himself, but like she's she's pretty excited about trying that. So that's something we're looking to get into. So this is what I chose, and I actually ended up working out pretty like musically working out really well for the theme of forest. Yes, and it's funny because the music would probably well work well for the game that I had in mind for this, too. <laughs> so, the game is called Fire Tower. It's published by Runaway Parade Games, and it was designed by Samuel Bryant and Gwen Ruel. So, Fire Tower is an interesting little game where it's like a... I'm just making up the numbers because I don't remember the exact dimensions. Like, it's like a 32 by 32 square grid board, right? And at the four corners, there are, like, towers... Like, you know, what it tells you might find, like, in a forest in Oregon or something, where like, they get up there with the binoculars and looking for, like, threats or whatever. And uh, at the center of the board, a fire is started. And on each turn, based on the wind and different actions, the fire spreads out into the woods, eventually burning down all of the towers. The goal, however, is to have it set your tower is the last one to get burned down. Hmm. 
you have cards that have different actions on them, whether it be related to like laying down new fire items or changing the direction of the wind flow, or you have like this card for like bucket, a, one bucket of water that you can use at once the entire game. You can douse flames with it. Um, and there's just like, and like other things where you can just like, like, it's like these like little pyres, you can like block off the fire direction. So you can like, okay, I don't need to put a wall here. So like people can like not get fire in my direction. So you can wall it off. Um, and it ends up being this really interesting strategic play where like you're trying to form alliances. Like, hey man, we're on the same semi quadrant of the map. So how about you work with me to protect my tower? And the one friend I was playing with, Mark, uh, he was, he was trying to come for me from the start. I'm like, you don't want to do that, man. We should be on the same team. You're kind of close to my tower. And he was like, nope, going for Purnell. I was like, well, crack knuckles. Got to take you out. <laughs> and sure enough, I manipulated that board at everybody. I was like, oh, we got to get Mark, guys. We got, we got to get Mark. <laughs> and, of and, and eventually, by the end of the game, I somehow ended up winning this one. But I wasn't expecting to because all I took, all would have taken is one person to snap and go, no, Purnell's manipulating us. But I was like, no, I'm not manipulating. We're working together. This is a team effort. But it's cool also because after you use your water bucket, if you get yourself in a position where like you're kind of like and like about to just lose anyway, you can like do this like weird condition where like you almost become a pyromaniac where you just like start tossing fires into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> like you basically lose your mental composure and you're just like just tossing oh, flames that's out. Interesting. There used to be a, a DOS game that I played way back in the day. I downloaded it from um, a BBS. Because I didn't know, like those days, you go to a, a bulletin board, you would dial into the bulletin board, and it, maybe they'll have a list of games, right? But like the games wouldn't have titles; they would just be files, and so you weren't mm. always sure what you were downloading. And so I downloaded this one game called Pyro. I think it was just called Pyro or Pyromaniac, and <laughs> everything was represented by just blocks. It was like this was that that era of video games. So it was just blocks. Your your guy was like a red block. Everything else was just gray blocks. And the idea was was that you're in a building. You're on the top floor of like maybe a 20-floor building. And throughout oh, okay. every floor of the building, you have strategically placed barrels of gasoline. And at the top floor, you're starting a fire and trying to run through every floor, knocking over barrels of gasoline to, to ignite the room faster, <laughs> while at the same time trying to outrun the fire behind you going down each floor <laughs> like this guy is crazy and, but he's not too crazy he wants it, was, to live. A, it was a really interesting puzzle game in that it was like really fast and you had to like kind of plan your routes really carefully so that you wouldn't have to double back on yourself into the fire um but it was just because i maybe like maybe the maybe it was a programming um um exercise of like you know maybe modeling fire or modeling how something would spread across the screen. <laughs> and so they just called it like, oh, what if you were starting a fire through a building? <laughs> and I, I would go and, and I would read the what the game was about and think, oh, this is this is actually kind of, you know, not great. It's a little violent. But but the reality was, was the game was just all squares. Just r- sh- shades of orange and red and yellow. <laughs> Sometimes I can I do think it's safe to say, and this goes for video games mm-hmm. too. Well, obviously, because you're describing a video game, actually. Yeah. But, uh, like, sometimes the theme could be outside of the scope that someone will be interested in, whether it's, like you say, like, I'm not a big fan of violent games, or I'm not a big fan of, like, introspective games, or whatever. But if the mechanics work, and they can pull the player in enough to say, you know, I'm not really concerned about my dislike of the theme right now. I kind of like setting these fires and working out the puzzle of getting to the bottom, you know? Like, I feel like that, that has a weird knack. Like, I've done that with a couple of games in the past where I was like, I don't really like this theme at all, but I really like the, the gameplay that comes out of it. Mm. I want to see more. So, I uh. Wow, I just, I just found it on YouTube. That is incredible that I just found that. I'll have to send it to you. Because <laughs> it, it, it is straight up... <laughs> It is straight up ASCII art. Oh my gosh, that is. No, that will uh, be something to look at later because I do want to see this. Yeah, like you look yeah. like dropping in the Discord chat or something. Yeah. All right. So what's your uh, what's your next track? All right. So bop a dop bop. Flip the page back. Um, the next topic of choice I got here is head to head, and this was a good excuse to put this track on the show because I've wanted to play it on here for a while now. Um, this comes from the game Clubhouse Games Worldwide and uh, on the Nintendo Switch. And the topic or the track title is called Light Board Games Theme and is composed by Chami Ishii and Toshiki Ida.
Welcome back. You're listening to Light Board Games theme from the game Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics for the Nintendo Switch, composed by Chami, Ishii, and Toshiki Ida, with the topic suggestion for this being Head to Head. Now, my choice of this track is, well, you heard it, it's freaking bangers. Um, I've been a fan of this track ever since buying Clubhouse Games 51, and though it's called Light Board Games Theme, which means it play, probably plays across multiple games on this collection, I don't care. I only play one game, and I play it ad nauseum, and that game is Moncala, which I had never played until Clubhouse Games, despite knowing it existed. And it's addictive. It's really fun. It's a 1v1 game where the idea is that you're, there's like a bunch of like... This game could be marbles or pips or whatever, but there are a bunch of these things and a, a number of cups that are like in like a sort of like rectangular form pattern. And you pick up a bunch of them and you drop like you drop the individual ones in like respective, like the follow the sequential ones mm -hmm. and then take the group that is one color that you collected. So if it's like, I might probably get this wrong because it's been a minute, but it's like, let's say there's like five in there. I want to take those five. I get points for those, but then the ones that I don't take, I kind of like drop individual marbles across the, the respective following cups and then let the next player choose. And the goal is to not give someone a bonanza of pips to choose from that are like, I want to say it's like three ahead of the last cup or something like that. So it's interesting. Like it's like this weird mind game. We're like, okay, well, I'm going to take these, these pips here. One, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. And I didn't leave you any good moves to go beyond this. But then the next one, my hope is that you'll take something that leaves me like a payday. Like to take them all out and get my points cup or whatever. Um, I played through all the difficulties of this thing. I never got to play with another human. I always play against the PC. But I played on the expert difficulty now. And I'm just like a big fan of it. I love head-to-head -head games. I am a chump for them. I don't get to play them often enough. But when I do, look out. And the actual game, board game... Though technically Mancala is also a board game that I chose in reference to this topic is called Summoner Wars. This is published by Plaid Hat Games and designed by Colby Douch. Now, I didn't get a review copy of Summoner Wars, but I did get a review copy of a similar game from the same company that we definitely have to play at some point. And thankfully, it's not as complicated as Summoner Wars, so easier to teach. Okay, um, good, good. But Summoner Wars is a 1v1 game where you're on a board that's kind of like a 5x10, let's say. And each of those spaces can um, occupy a unit. And the units are represented by cards. Um, the characters are all summoners. They are leader units. And the goal is to destroy or kill the other player's summoner. Hmm. Now, what the summoner does is he can place gates on this map, which he can use to summon units out of. Think of like an actual like strategy game that you can play on like like Final Fantasy Tactics or something like that. Mm -hmm. And each of these characters have a movement range, an attack range, power level, special abilities associated with them, the works. And it is deeply strategic because you're out technically trying to maneuver on this board to kill the lead general, which is basically a summoner. And you can also attempt to destroy the gates that are on the board so that they can't summon units anymore. Are both players have like the same strategies or is this one of those nope. asymmetric? They're asymmetric. Games? Oh, that's cool. Asymmetric. Yeah. I find, so like, I find for those, example... Like I find this idea of those games really interesting, but difficult to teach because suddenly you have to teach people two sets of rules to understand the game fully. Well, the thing about it is I feel, at least in this case... Because this is what happened when we were playing it. So it was Mark and I. Mm. And uh, neither of us ever played this game before. And I, Mark will kill me if he hears this, but I genuinely believe I have more like game experience than him in this scope. So like we were both trying to pick this game up. The guy say, here's your decks. My character was a summoner that was focused on mind control. So I could manipulate other people's units. And his summoner was focused around just like kamikaze like grunt attacks like trolls and such so we didn't know how our characters play we didn't know what our units were like we just took the game was like okay here you go here are the base rules have fun and as we were playing we were, i was like okay my character this guy can do this and given the state on the board i can work with this bam i'll put him out there so as the game progressed it got to the point where i was like you know me when i play games rob i get really frustrated sometimes i'm like oh i'm getting my butt beat the frustration setting in, and I started to kind of zone out. I'm like, I just got to focus. I'm losing. I'm losing. I'm losing. But then I had an idea, 
and I'm not making this up. It was a seven turn gambit. I was like, okay, I got to play this out over seven turns. If I can work him into it, I'm going to win the game. It happened. Ooh. And it was an idea where the goal was to get his most powerful unit juiced up because he was juicing up a guy that was going to wreck my team. Mm -hmm. He juices them up. He gets them in a position. I was going to put another unit two turns, two spaces away from him. And I had an ability that lets the person pull another unit closer to them. And then my main summoner had one time I could do this where for one turn, I could manipulate a unit within two spaces of me from the opposing team and they become my unit. So I took his special unit and ran up to him and started just like ran this stuff. Now, it would, was a lot of fun. Would he, would normally, would he have been aware of those strategies? Like of how those strategies would have worked though? He knew that I had mind control abilities, but he didn't know what specific ones I had. I see. So, and, but the, by that same logic, I didn't know what he could do either until he employed it. Like right. there were things he was doing. I was like, wait, you could do that? <laughs> oh man. And it was like putting me in a really bad spot. I was like, how do I get around that? I got to figure this out. Now, obviously with these kinds of games, this goes for like video games too. When you have asymmetric units, the general idea is that you play the game a lot. So that you end up knowing them. Like think of fighting games, like you love fighting games, right? If you never played Street Fighter V, and you just jumped in there and said, I'm gonna use this character because she has a really cool outfit and she throws boomerangs, that's her thing, I guess. And you're like, I'm fighting, I'm fighting. And this other character is just kind of getting your face. He's trying to get in your face. Like, why are you rushing me? I thought you wanted to stay away from me. Turns out he's a grappler, right? So now you have to know who are the grapplers, who are the projectile guys, who's the guy that can do this? And you don't generally learn that until you play over time. Mm. But until you get to that point, there's a specific other type of gameplay style that comes into play. And that is versatility and being able to work on the fly based on what you're, what you're being encountered by. And that's the area where I excel at because I'm terrible at remembering what all these different guys <laughs> can do and what their actual deck capabilities are. All you gotta tell me is this guy controls trolls. I'm like, okay. I mean, he's going to probably have a lot of, like, Russian attack abilities. I don't know what they are, though. Right, yeah. So just can, that he can do them. Yeah, some reaction that you can do, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's how I roll. But once you're like, okay, now we're doing the meta game, the, what did my one friend call it? The Yomi or whatever, where it's like, I don't know what these guys are doing. And that's why I've never really been good at fighters overall, because I feel like to be good at those, you actually have to know what your opponents can do. Yeah, there's a lot of studying. There's a lot of, there's a lot of homework <laughs> that goes into this really? stuff. Maybe that's why I'm not playing as much anymore. Um, all right, so what's my final track, Purnell? What's my final topic? Because there's, right. there's only one track that's going to fit these last two topics. <laughs> but then the bonus shell is going to be especially hilarious. Yeah. Um, I'll go with this. Favorite animal. My f Oh, okay. Favorite animal. Um, well, wildlife can certainly be a topic within Trivial Pursuit. Ooh. This is Good pull. This is the game Trivial Pursuit Live. Um, the composer is unknown. The track is the title screen. Here we go.
Thank you're listening you. to the main theme from Trivial Pursuit colon live exclamation point. <laughs> this came mm. out on PS4, Xbox One, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3. It's on the Switch. This is an online live game of Trivial Pursuit. You can play with your friends and your family and you can feel smart for beating your friends and feel stupid from your family beating you. <laughs> That's uh, my life in Trivial Pursuit. That is trivial terrible that pursuit. game. Oh my gosh. And there's title, title screen music. Um, the composer is unknown, but this is a Ubisoft developed and um, produced jam. So This might be my track of the episode right now. Really? I'm, 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 I'm swinging to this. I'm, I'm no, admittedly, you. I do like my, my, my witch track too, but I'm really bopping here. Yeah, this is this is very much in the same vein as the Clubhouse Games track. It's just very like light, kind of background. Like I can see myself like hearing this in a department store, you know? Like, oh like, yeah. Yeah, I'm picking out a shirt. Well, like a lot of those Xbox 360 games we used to play where like you're like waiting for the actual game to start like okay looking yeah. for players and you're like while you're there it's like I'm gonna get myself a drink and deep down you're actually bopping to that track waiting yeah, for yeah, love. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I'll just leave this on and there's like a there's like a group chat going on. It's like, hey, hey, go don't start the game yet. Hold on, I gotta put the kids to bed. <laughs> this is oh. legit. Oh, I'm Make you want to play Trivial Pursuit. Too bad I hate Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I like trivia games. There was a while. There was a time where I was like really getting into um, Jeopardy, watching reruns of Jeopardy on um, Netflix and Hulu and stuff like that. But I was I'm always I'm never good at them. I just always I always like watching it and going, oh, that's in that's new, that's new facts well, that I didn't know before, but now I know. <laughs> well, here's the thing though. It's like it's not to say I just like trivia games. Trivia games are fun. Mm. Trivial Pursuit, on the other hand, is an act of frustration because <laughs> I can't speak for everybody, but my experience is usually you got to get five slices of pie, yeah. and each slice comes from a different category, and I kick butt at two of them. I can wing the third. I get lucky on the fourth, but the fifth one, sports. Yeah. Get out of here. And Ain't one happening. Of the, one of those wedges has to be sports. <laughs> And in the end, I'm just like, every answer is like, is it Michael Jordan? No. Is it Michael Jordan? No. Is it Michael Jordan? No. Is it Michael Jordan? You got your pie slice, if I'm lucky. Well, Otherwise, always, I'm just going to keep saying always, Michael Jordan uh, or Babe Ruth. There's always sports and entertainment, I think is what it was for a lot of these. And so we would just keep hitting that square and being like, okay, come on, entertainment. Give me entertainment. <laughs> yep. And if you can't find anything for the topic, you're just going to lose because <laughs> you just don't know the topic. Like trivia games, like the sweeter ones, I feel either A, might make you hit a multitude of topics, but you don't have to hit every topic, which means you don't have to struggle through the thing you just don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, or it's just wild, ridiculous stuff that no one's really a master. It's just like, this might be the thing you understand. Like, Danny Tanner was obsessed with what? Like, who the heck is Danny Tanner? Like, someone might know, but I'm not the guy who watched Full House. You know, like, it just, it's the kind of thing I like, though. It's random questions that can come from anything, and you just don't just, know yeah. if you're going to get but that's it that's the skill, though. That's the skill that some people like to flex, you know, and their brains of, like, pulling out trivia from different parts of their brain. That mm-hmm. you, you would never stick next to each other, but some people and love that. that. I love. I, I think yeah, it's I'm cool. that guy. I'm one of those guys. Yeah, it's just, but it's it's just the the trivia pursuit version. I don't know sports. Stop forcing me to understand sports. So I don't know if I have a favorite animal. I will say I love uh, sheep. I think sheep are adorable, and they're amazing. Bam. Yeah. So what, I'm what, a sucker for what, pigs. What game? What game does favorite animal come into? Or were you just making it up? No, the topic's irrelevant. So, um, this game is from one of my favorite designers, Uwe Rosenberg. This is called New York Zoo, and it was published by a good publisher, Capstone Games. New York Zoo is a game that actually Mark purchased, so we can play that at some point. Um, the idea is that you are running a zoo, and just like a lot of Uwe Rosenberg's other games, it makes use of tetrominoes. You're drafting tetrominoes to create pens in your zoo, and then you can get animals to place into the zoo places. And after a certain place around the rondelle board that exists, those animals can breed if there's two or more on the spot in the pen. So you can increase your number of animals in there. And once you fill the pen with animals, you can get an attraction that is basically just meant to fill more of your zoo space up, Hmm. with the ultimate goal being to fill your entire zoo and clear the entire board. And it's, it's a simple game, but 
just like his other games, it involves a lot of spatial reasoning, which is where the challenge comes in. Um, because you might be like, okay, well, these are clearly the best tiles to get, but the problem is they might seem like it, but then like in Tetris, now you suddenly find yourself with these weird odd shaped pockets that you have to fill somehow and you don't know how you're going to do it. And that's where you start to screw up, which is how I screwed up. But initially I was on a road thinking, oh yeah, I got the biggest pins. My animals are happy, but you also want small pins because you can fill them faster, which gets you more attractions. So... It's a. Uh, it sounds it's a cool. cool. It's like game. a like a sim like a sim Z, sim city or sim zoo type thing. Yeah, yeah, that's that exactly sounds, what it's I like. I like that. That sounds fun. And there's kangaroos. There's penguins. There's uh, freaking animals. Uh, flamingos, pandas. There's a lot, and they're like these little. They're all like animal meeples. So it's like it's pretty oh, cool. I like that. Um, I, I have a correction. I played music from the game Scrabble Complete, and I found the composer. His name is Anthony Trippy. And the Ooh. developer was Infogram. So. Oh, Mr. Trippy would appreciate it. I wonder if it's the same Scrabble that they released on PlayStation 1, because I actually have that. I don't know. This Scrabble Complete was a PC game released in 2002. Okay, probably not the same game, because yeah, the Scrabble not. I bought came out in like the 90s on PlayStation 1. But I was able to find the... Uh, able to <laughs> Let find, me find the out right the heck now. Well, that's not the same one. I'll find it later. Maybe on the next track selection. I'm positive I still have that Scrabble game in this room right now. So well, you are in the retro room. The retro red room. Retro room. <laughs> Which I always find interesting when it comes to this friggin' room. Like it comes up a lot in discussions where people are like, you know, buying like these retro consoles, like these new retro consoles, mind you, like the analogs. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, I have all these old cards where I just got to get a ROM card or whatever. In my case, like, I don't go back to buy new old stuff anymore, hmm. but I also don't have the interest in getting rid of my old old stuff. Yeah, like I like a lot of people are interested in buying new newer older stuff, like a new like a new Mega Drive, right, or a new Super Nintendo because they don't have them anymore. <laughs> oh no, no no I don't mean like that. The consoles they're designed to play the old stuff, but some people would just buy like an EverDrive, right, ah, which yeah. is like a ROM cart. Um, but I'm saying like. There'll be people like, I just got this cart, and it'll be like Legend of the Mystical Ninja for the Super Nintendo. I'm like, that's pretty, that's a cool find, but I already own it. But if I didn't, I wouldn't go find it again. I'm like, I got ROMs for that now. Yeah. But if my old game existed, I don't want to get rid of it. I like having the original, but I don't want to go out and find the original anew if I don't have it anymore. The memory is a large part of why I keep this stuff. Which is might be weird sounding, but I think that's just kind of what it is. I'm attached to all my old junk. <laughs> No, I think that's important too. I mean, important for people to remember, like especially with this hobby. Like, like it's not just the games that you remember, but it's the the memories attached to them too. And so, if you can hang on to them, you know, in a in a in a way that's not going to destroy the games, I think that's awesome. Because you're preserving. And it actually factors into the show too. Like, I do love how like I'll be coming up with a track topic or title or track for the topic, and I'm like, what I got? And I'm looking, there's like, oh, witch's tail. I never got to play that, and now I want to play it because now I have a good excuse for it. Now I'm like digging up this old retro game that I bought, and I remember why I bought it, just that I never had time hmm. to start because of life. But now you might try it. Out, you might you might throw it on, throw throw it throw it down. <laughs> um, tonight I'm gonna play it. I'm gonna play it after the episode. I'm gonna see what it. this game was all about. I should be playing Mega Ten Five, but you know, sometimes. Ah, you got you got plenty of time to play Mega Ten Five, just like I had plenty of time to. Turn this track down and get into <laughs> the bonus round. The bonus round, round, round. The right. bonus the round. Bonus round. Oh, get down. Bonus round is where we play covers and remixes and arrangements on our theme. Pernell, what is your track for the bonus round? All right. So my final topic is retro youth, which sounds weird, but I have a reason for calling it that. And I definitely think we could do a full episode based on this. Um, so the track itself that I chose is uh, is composed, remixed or covered by a person that has been suggested for us to play on the show for a while now. And it just so happened that I came across a track. I was like, oh, she did this. Perfect choice. Um, this is a cover from the game Final Fantasy Adventure. It's called Searching for the Sacred Sword Orchestral Remix. And it's covered by Rebecca Tripp.
Fantastic, fantastic yeah, track. That is a uh, Searching for the Sacred Sword orchestral remix covered for a remix from the game Final Fantasy Adventure from the Nintendo Game Boy and done covered remixed by Rebecca Tripp. This puts it on the map. This is a fantastic track. I love it. And it helps that this is a cover of one of my all time favorite tracks, probably ever. Like, I have genuine, heartfelt nostalgia for this tune. Mm. It hits it hits me hard when I listen to yeah, it all the time. I love the music of Final Fantasy Adventure. It's so good, and it's appropriate for this track of this retro youth topic because well, one, I have retro youthful memories of it. Two, it's in black and white, and the game that it's associated with is basically called Micro Macro Crime City. It was published by Pegasus Spiel and designed or created by Johannes Sieck. Uh, so this game is black and white. It is the best way to describe it visually is if you remember those old, like, you know, what is those that magazine highlights for children books where it was like hidden pictures in those books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, where it's like this large cityscape with people doing a bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's like, find the kid with the hula hoop, find the guy with the hat. Um, it's that tuned up to like 11 because you're also a detective and there are like 17 cases in the game. Where the idea is that it'll be like a murder case was like, okay, such and such was murdered um, outside the bakery. Can you find the body? And you go to look at the picture. And whereas normally a hit, the idea of a hidden picture is this thing is obscured and out of sight. In the case of this game, there's so much stuff on the screen. It's really only obscured when you want to find it. <laughs> because now that you're trying to hone in on something, now you can't see it. Um, but normally it's just, it's right there in plain view. And then another cool thing is after you find that, it might say, okay, now let's, let's try to figure out where he originally came from before he was murdered in this alley. So the game is not just designed to have one person in one place. It actually will have the same person in different spots. So you can kind of trace their direction, like where they were coming from, where they were going. So you might see a moped in this square. So like, okay, he's facing this direction. Logically speaking, he probably came from here. But the pizza shop he came from is on this street. So he couldn't have gone farther than here. Bam, I found him. He's like, you'll spot him. And it got to the point where I went from being like, this is a stupid game to Eureka, I found the guy. He's right there. And Mark's like, you're getting really excited about this. Like, yeah, because I found the guy. Let's keep looking. (laughs) That's the next clue. And um, it's just, it's strangely addictive. Like it's, it's fun to look at this massive map and try to like find the tiny guy behind the shop <laughs> that you're trying to find. And sometimes it's like deductive reasoning to put you there too. It's so, really cool. And also maybe because the scenarios that you're looking for are different, it creates more replayability because you're not looking for the same thing every time, right? These things might 
you might recognize again, maybe through a second playthrough, but they might be related to a different like scenario. Yep. That actually happened a few times too. Like you might be like, Oh, I remember the guy with the big hat. He was around here. Right. Wait, I think I saw a guy that looked like the guy we're looking for back when I was investigating that case. He was over and found him. And it's like, it's just fun. And obviously you could, if you have a really good memory, you might do all 17 cases and go, well, now I can't do them ever again because I remember everything. Like, I remember where everybody was ever. But even if you are that guy, they do have extra cases you can buy to work with the same game. Like, he creates new ones all the time. And, of course, if you get tired of it, let's just be honest here. You played 17 cases. You probably got your money's worth. And that's that a, that's mean that if you played through 17, that's pretty great, you know. And, and But, like, that artwork that must have went in, like the, the, the work that went into the artwork must have been insane. Like, really, really intricate, really detailed. Um, this game more so, like more so than a lot of the other ones you've discussed tonight. I mean, I've seen pictures of it. I've been very interested in it because it's just so different. And from our interesting mm-hmm. video game tie-in, there actually is a case that involves Mario and Luigi piece, oh. <laughs> which I kind of chose. Like, oh, that's Mario. Nice. All right. The um, so oh, do you have a topic for me, or my cat just play my track? No, no. There's always a topic, sir. There's oh, no. always a topic. So the last topic you have is medieval. Okay, great. So the track I'm playing from is from a medieval. No, not at all. It's <laughs> oh, you're gonna say from the game medieval. Like what a coincidence. No, this is Monopoly for the Super Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> medieval edition. It's like um uh the the Renaissance Fairopoly version of. Um, <laughs> this track of is called "On the Ramparts of North Carolina Avenue." <laughs> So, uh, Monopoly for the Super Nintendo has music composed by Koichi Sugiyama, you know, composer of Ooh. the Dragon Warrior series. And so, as such, there is a whole um, arranged soundtrack for a string quartet for the Monopoly sound for the for the Monopoly Super Nintendo soundtrack. That is so. This wild. is called the Street Adventure by the String Quartet Monopoly. Um, this is. <laughs> This is uh, composed by Kuichi Sugiyama and performed by the Boardwalk String Quartet, Takashi Kato, Kiyoshi Osawa, Hiroshi Watanabe, and Hiroto Kawamura.
That was The Street Adventure from Monopoly for the Super Nintendo, composed by Koichi Sugiyama and performed by the Boardwalk String Quartet. Takashi Keito, Kiyoshi Osawa, Hiroshi Watanabe, and Hiroto Kawamura. Ooh. I, I got to say, I'll give you that because... Considering that the composer was originally, you know, Koichi Sugiyama, who was pretty much, like you said, the Dragon Quest daddy for music, yeah. which in itself is like the like one of the daddies of like JRPGs. Uh, and this orchestral version sounds like it came out of Dragon Quest. You win this round. <laughs> Going back and listening to the original Monopoly soundtrack for the Super Nintendo, I, I mean, as a kid, I, I didn't make that connection, but hearing it now, I can hear... The, the Dragon Quest influence, the Dragon Warrior influence of the of the soundtrack with 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 that and um and then of course playing that back to back with the string quartet arrangement. It's you can hear exactly what he wanted to realize using the hardware. But like hearing the the quartet version, the live version of this music, it's like, oh, I see what he was going for. I I, I, see, I realized what he was doing. Yeah, it's like Erdrick himself is traversing the streets of Atlantic <laughs> City, purchasing properties and hey, destroying dragons it, along the way. It didn't matter what game he was working working on; like he put everything into it. He he was composing what he wanted. I mean, if, they, if you hired Koichi Sugiyama for a game, like you knew what you were getting because he had been a he had been such a um, a composer for cinema and for movies and for television for so long. Like you knew what you were getting. He had chops. Yeah. He had chops. <laughs> but so do you have a game to go along with Medieval? I do. So this final game is called Valiant Wars. It was published by Strange Machine Games and created by Quinn Washburn. I actually played it for the first time a few weeks before PAX because uh, a friend of mine has it and he, he was really excited about the game. Um, it's not a really complicated title. It is a deck builder, um, but it uses the bust mechanic that Mystic Veil kind of does where you pull cards from your deck and you get like you basically get resources from each card, whether it be money or fighting power. And eventually you get your first negative thing. The negative thing is bad. <laughs> and it's an omen that says, if you get one more like this, everything you did was for nothing. <laughs> so you decide, do you want to reach and get more money, more fighting power, or do you want to just stop right there? Now, the added caveat to that in this game is that the market the order of purchasing from the market is determined by who stops first. So if I pull my the, my desired amount of income before you do and I stop, I'll get the chance to buy the thing I want before you do, which means, hey, if we were saving for the same thing, you might want to stop before, while, you're, while you're ahead. But you can get a little greedy because you can buy more than one thing per turn if you got the money for it. Hmm. So it's an interesting tug of war. Now... Um, the fighting strength thing is a matter of like at the end of a round, if you have more fighting strength in your pool than the other surviving players, you get a star or two or whatever based on the card that's on the table that generates those things. Now, the stars are the condition for winning the game, so you want to get them. But the trade off is when you get them, you also get a card that corresponds to it. And the card goes into your deck, and when you pull it, it subtracts your money or subtracts your fighting power. So it's like a kneecap. Or a strike to your kneecap. It's a Tanya Harding, if you will, um, to your deck, yeah. making it so that even though you did well to get the card, you are now slogged out because you have it in your deck. So it's it's an interesting catch up mechanic, is what it is. Ooh. And you also get more dark omens the better you're doing. So it's another catch up mechanic that's in place there. It's a cool little game. Um, I almost bought it. The only reason I didn't was because I realized I still have Mystic Veil and a ton of expansions we never played. So I was like, you know, maybe I should focus on doing more with Mystic Veil and not buy another game that involves, you know, deck building and busting. But I did like the game a lot. And if I go to visit my friend in Baltimore, I would be happy to play it with him. I even got some promo cards for him specifically to give to him when I see him next. Um, but it's a cool little game. And the artwork is pretty nice. It's colorful. Um, very, you know, I don't, uh, I'd say creative. Um, it's still RPG themes. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not stuff you've never seen before. But I like the way that it is done to represent those character classes, the bartenders, the winged Pegasus Knight, and, you know, the fighter and the warrior, you know, the deal, the usual. Yeah, the, the usual. Yeah, yeah. you got the cleric and you got the dwarf and you got the, the, the dwarven cleric. 
the dwarven, the, how about you say the dwarf, <laughs> the, the dwarven cleric, the cleric dwarf, <laughs> the clerical dwarf. They're really good at typing. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, I, it's, it, it's quality stuff. Like, and it's funny because this comes up a lot and I got into like a little beef online about it too with a guy where, um, the discussion was someone that said, you know, is it just me or as I get older, do video game or so it was about board games initially. Like as I get older, board games lose a lot of their excitement because I feel like I've seen everything before. Like everything's been there, done that. And I said, yeah, just like video games and sometimes movies and TV shows, the older you get and the more you've been exposed to, the more you will have the been there, done that vibe because you have been there and done that. Everything's derived from something else at this point. And the rare times where you find it as a hundred percent unique, you will lose your crap to maintain the hold of it. Like, this is my baby. This is special. And then a guy came and laughed at me and was like, that's not true. Unless you're playing all the mainstream AAA stuff. I'm like, dude, I play over a hundred games a year. <laughs> I'm not making this sentiment up. It's real. And you don't even have to play that many games to know that. And I never said that rare games don't exist or unique games don't exist. It's just that they're less common. So... What that means, though, is that say Final Fantasy X, that's your baby, which is why I'm bringing it up. Mm-hmm. Um, you love that game. It has something special to you. You wouldn't deny that it's derivative of other RPGs, but what it did for you was special enough to say, this is my JRPG. This is the one I like to frequent and go back to. Just because it's derivative of something else doesn't make it a bad game. It doesn't make it a game that doesn't work. Yeah, it's but just- it, does, it does make it... It does. It does make it something that people can complain about. Yes, it, it, people can feel samey about it. Yeah. But if it hits your note, that makes it special, and that's totally fine. Mm. So in that case, how Valiant Wars would be for me? Like it's special. I think it's a great game. It's derived from other things, but what isn't? <laughs> I think the game is still legitimately fun. If I weren't hampered on holding on to all these freaking Mystic Veil vale cars, I probably would have purchased it. So. Well, um, if you're interested in more learning more about the bonus round tracks, and if you're interested in learning more about all the board games discussed in today's episode, go to rhythmandpixels.com. We'll have links to all of the publishers, all of these games, and all of these artists, band camps, and sound clouds where you can go and get the music and support these artists. Thank you for joining us on episode 30-9 of Rhythm and Pixels. This is our PAX Unplugged Super Show, where we are chatting about games and board games today. That we, that we that were experienced at PAX, that weren't experienced at PAX, and just gaming fun gabba gabba hey now. Um, but the idea is interesting that we were talking about earlier before the show started. It was like just what was PAX itself like, the show, given, you know, recent events and all, because I can't speak for everybody, but honestly, this was the first big show I attended since COVID kicked off. And I was initially anxious about attending it, but surprisingly, things, people were generally good about the rules. Um, they had it such you had to have a vaccination card at the door mm-hmm. to even get a bracelet to go in and claim your actual badge. So like, you could, if you didn't have your badge, you still had to have your vax card just to get the badge. Ooh. Um, and then once you showed it, they gave you a bracelet so that you didn't have to keep coming back with a new Vax card, with your Vax card every time. It was like, hey, I got my bracelet. I'm good to go. Um, and aside from like the usual, you know, like I'm in a food court, therefore I'm eating food. People generally kept their masks on. Hmm. Like, there was like one time I noticed like the person was like teaching me the game and she pulled her mask down because I guess she just got tired of wearing it. And the PAX employee came and was like, mask up. She was like, oh, I was, I was just drinking. I was like, no, you weren't. <laughs> you weren't drinking anything. So um, it was well, well enforced. So you felt pretty it good was, with that. I, I did feel good about it. Yeah. Like it was honestly a good thing. Like, I don't know how I'm going to feel going with this, you know, this Omicron stuff. And like, cause like obviously the rates are going up to the point where like they're doing like, you know, mandatory lockdowns again, not lockdowns, but like emergency calls. And so like Maryland just initiated one today, actually. Which may well affect Magfest. Um, I wonder how that's going to play out. Yeah, um, Magfest is in a week, two weeks. 
as a a week after this episode releases. Oh no, no, two weeks after this episode releases. Mm. Um, so it should be interesting to see how it goes because I was originally he's planning to go to Nerf for like a day or two for a panels I'm a, I'm supposed to be a part of, but I'm genuinely contemplating saying Nerf. Yeah, I'm backing a, out. It's a lot of people all in one room. A friend of mine actually reached out to me today. She wanted to see if I wanted to take her own ownership of her hotel room because she's canceling that. Mm. She's canceling her room at the Gaylord because she doesn't want to go because of COVID now. Um, so I was like, it's a reasonable thing. And when I told her message, she's like, I hope you don't go. <laughs> I really, I was, I was like, I offered the room to you, but honestly, I'd much prefer if you just didn't go at all. So I'm like, I'm considering it. We'll see. I might back out. But as far as PAX went, I was glad that it was before this whole thing got worse. Mm-hmm. And I thought they enforced it very well. It felt good to be back around, you know, this whole scene. Unfortunately, the interesting thing about it, though, was that a lot of the games that would normally have been there weren't because of the supply chain issues with all the boats off the coast. Um, a lot of these, a lot of the companies didn't have their shipments in because they were stuck out in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. A lot of games are are, are published by one company, but the, the 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 parts and especially the 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 raw the raw uh, ingredients <laughs> that go into the card these cardboard <laughs> and plastic games are coming from overseas. And and um, yeah, all of all of these problems with with our um, the ports and all yeah, all that stuff it's causing issues with everything. So. Yeah, I can see that being a really big problem with these with these game publishers, especially the, the indie game publishers, who are just doing the best that they can with smaller yeah, it budgets. Was bad. Yeah, like some companies were there with their purchase booths, and they were like showing off the game, and somebody would be like, "Oh, I really want this game. How much is it?" Like, well, it would be fifty dollars, <laughs> but it's currently in the middle of Pacific Ocean, so here's a card, and uh, hopefully you'll buy it later. So it's like they had oh, to basically I mean, purchase this booth. Yeah. Which cost them money, but now they don't have the merchandise. Where at a time where they would have been flipping yeah, it for like you know the say, FOMO. It's probably and, even like a big. It's probably even a big decision just to even continue to purchase the booth to an event that people may or may not may many as many people may not be going to. Where normally I think a booth at a PAX related event is probably really good to have for. Oh, it's mint. Yeah, well, they are mint. And honestly, I can definitely tell you that even though I think overall they did okay. Mm-hmm. It was obvious that a lot of the vendors didn't sell what they normally would. Like, there was like a couple booths that did the whole last day. We got to just unload 40, 50% off of everything because they didn't want to ship it back home. So, you know, people were rushing the booths to buy the stuff on deep discount. And, like, there was a game called Descent, which sells for like 150 bucks. One booth had it for 60% off. It was ridiculous. Oh, wow. I watched people dang near fight for that. Thing. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but, uh,. All in all, though, I do feel like I do feel I was happy to have attended it, though it does help that the type of convention that PAX Unplugged is, is fairly conducive for like low key, the sit down in a small group and just play board games at a table. Yeah. And not a bunch of people running around being loud. It's not a big concert setting. It's not a big like everyone, you know, getting drunk and throwing raves like in in their in their um, in their hotel room type thing. Exactly. Yeah. It's definitely a different type of event. So that that's good. Um, but if you would like to know about this event, the Rhythm and Pixels podcast, if you'd like to know more <laughs> about this show, um, in fact, to get a full track listing from this show and from all of our episodes, you need to go to our website. www. I can't believe I did that. Rhythmandpixels.com. It's okay. I paid for both. <laughs> it's included. It's fine. So go to the web. Yeah, you can go to our website there. And if you want to get in contact with us, if you want to say hi, if you want to send a track suggestion or a topic suggestion or just anything, if you just want to tell us how we're doing, send us an email. That's the best way to get a hold of us. Rhythmandpixels at hotmail.com. Yes, we still use Hotmail, and no, I will not change it. <laughs> it's a good it's a good service. It works. A quality, it just, home-felt service. It just works. Um, and <laughs> uh, if you want to check us out on any other places online, you can go to Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. It's uh, Rhythm and Pixels, all one word. We have a 24-7, 8-bit, and 16-bit radio station playing nothing but 8-bit and 16-bit classics there on YouTube.com slash Rhythm and Pixels. And it's also uh, restreamed on Twitch.tv slash Rhythm and Pixels. So you can check all of that out there. Leave the music playing on. Even if you're Twitch streaming, you can play it in the background because none of it is going to get flagged for content. I guarantee you that. Um, it I was it, it was it was getting flagged for content. I had to remove um, the the Mega Ten music from the stream. Really? Yeah. Wow. So make it. Make I guess it Atlas yeah. wasn't messing around. They were not. <laughs> they were not. Those were the only songs getting flagged. So, so you can stream that in the background and and rest assured knowing that you know you can listen to Monopoly music while you're playing. I don't know 
Apex Legends. So that's all right. <laughs> well, I mean, you're still buying properties. I mean, capturing the flag or capturing the mountain, the, the, the zone, <laughs> buying a property. And if you want to support the show, you can do that in a number of ways. You can just uh, tell people about it. You can hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you're listening to this on. You can go to rhythmandpixels.com slash merch, and you can think about maybe purchasing a T-shirt. A VGM related t-shirt it doesn't have to be related to the podcast it can say SNK on the cover on the front of it it can say Falcom on the front um, we got some really cool t-shirts go check that out there rhythmandpixels.com slash merch um, you can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash rhythmandpixels there you get access to, for at all levels you get access to uh, prequel episodes that me and Pranal occasionally do and we actually have one coming out uh, this week and you can also um, you also get access to a monthly live stream uh, of a show. It's just me and Pranav recording live. That show gets uh, released into the normal podcast stream of the consciousness thing that we do. So check that <laughs> out. I'm losing my mind. So <laughs> check that out there. Also Persona 5. hi oh. Um, and uh, also on Patreon, you can get some cool stuff like uh, there's mugs and there's stickers and there's even t-shirts at all the highest levels. Um, and at the... at all of our highest levels we'd like to thank our members at the end of every episode thank we would like to thank frankly zappa Kristen, mike myers Ulf person fashion 8060 and we have um alex the messenger from a vgm journey andreas milberg brian pitt cameron worma camille carlos kung fu carlito from the heroes 3 podcast chris weisner aka musashi 219 christopher senstrom davy cakes david taylor harold howard Justin Schneider from XVGM Radio, Dr. Michael Bridgewater from the Forever Sound Version Podcast, Michael Jennings, Rage Cage, Reinhardt Zelkova, Sleepy S'more, Steve Miller, Taco, the Autistic Gamer 89, Ed Wilson from the VG Embassy. 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 Embassy? Embassy? Embassy. <laughs> embassy. So thank you all very, very much for your continued support of our show. I really, really appreciate it. Um, all the kind words, all the kind emails, um, seeing your names every week. It's its very motivating for us to continue to make the best podcast that we can. I hope you enjoyed the music today. Hope you enjoyed the, the board board game talk today. Hope you enjoyed hope you Pernell. enjoyed. Hope you enjoyed stuff. Just enjoy. <laughs> we hope you enjoy. Yeah, and if anything, if, if you don't try any of the games we talked about, um, definitely consider looking at the board game space. There's a lot of great games out there now. A lot of them available widely at places like Target and Barnes and & Nobles and um, your local gas station. Check it all out. There's a lot of great games. That you He's not try kidding out. either. <laughs> they really are at gas stations too. And a lot of them you can get them for dirt cheap depending on where you look. Yeah, I mean, there's options out there. But yeah, go go take a look. There are some really cool ones out there. So um, thanks for listening to the show. Next week is our live episode where we have um, not give thanks, but give gifts, the gift of video game music to each other. So my name is Rob Nichols. And I'm Pernell. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. And remember, well, um, you probably heard, obviously you heard over the course of the episode, the topic of, you know, COVID came up a few times because tis the season. Ha, 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 ha. Um, so there's a general stigma that goes around when it comes to the idea of it. Some people may not really care about it too much. Others might care about it a lot. Um, but one thing that is, I personally feel is still extremely important is uh, if you come in contact with it, like if you find out that you definitely came in contact with it, whether you have it or not, um, it's just right to let people that you've been around know that you came in contact with it. What they choose to do with that knowledge is their business, mind you. Um, you're not responsible for that. Uh, but it's good to give that person the knowledge to make choices that may or may not affect others around them. Because while it is true that we do have the right to make our own choices... Those choices are connected to those around us and they bear the consequences of our choices, regardless of whether or not we want them to, which is why it's a surprisingly complicated, but also not particularly complicated issue. Just be honest with yourself. Be honest with your friends and family and just state it. There's no, and also most importantly related to this, there's no, if you're long as you're doing what you the best of your ability, there's literally no shame in contracting this thing. It's everywhere. 
you don't have to be ashamed if you contract it. But you do need to let people know if you've been in the presence of someone that had it. So that you can let the next person know and be prepared for what could or could not happen. Big deal. Do your part. I'm going to drink this blue water. 